Welcome to Discovering the Law. My name is attorney Lucy Rivera. And this episode, we're going to feature someone very special. This episode can be viewed at www.discoveringthelaw.com. Today, we have fabulous superstar, civil rights attorney, former law professor, and now author, Professor Michael Avery. Welcome to the show, Professor Avery. Well, thank you very much, Lucy. It's a pleasure to be here. It's, the pleasure is all ours. We want, uh, we're bringing you here today because we hear you have a new book, The Cooperating Witness. Yes. What is The Cooperating Witness about? Here oh, we look, are. that's the book right there. Oh. <laughs> well, it's about a, a Suffolk law student named Susan Sorella, who has an internship with a lawyer in Boston who's kind of a burned out, uh, uh, sort of jaded uh, criminal defense lawyer who who doesn't do much uh, except, uh, you know, get his clients to plead guilty, but suddenly he finds himself in the middle of a murder case and uh, his assistant, Susan Sorella, uh, he's lucky to have her because he could never do this case, but she rises to the occasion and uh, sort of unravels the mystery of the case. That sounds really interesting. Um, your main character is a woman, Susan Sorella. What is she like? Well, Susan is a very uh, idealistic uh, law student. Uh, she's an Italian-American uh, young woman. Her father has a restaurant on Hanover Street in the North End. Uh, Italian restaurant, and uh, she's really a sort of a first-generation professional. Uh, she went to college, and, and now she's at Suffolk Law School, and uh, she, she wants to become uh, the kind of lawyer who, who does what's right. Um, uh, that sounds very inspiring. Um, did you base... Susan Sorella on um, any woman, any particular woman or any of your students, any student that you taught to at Suffolk Law? Well, you know, I, I had a lot of idealistic uh, students, yourself included, uh, who were uh, looking forward to practicing law. I, I wouldn't say Susan is based on any particular young woman that I knew in my classes. Uh, but I would say she combines some of the best uh, attributes of uh, many young women students at Suffolk Law School. Uh, Suffolk has uh, an excellent reputation and it has the kind of students who don't take anything for granted. Uh, maybe they weren't born with a silver spoon in their mouth. Uh, maybe they had to struggle a little to get where they are. And, uh, you know, they, they try hard to make good. And, and that's sort of what Susan's about. She, she has a lot of obstacles in her way as she goes forward. Her, her boss is uh, a sexist. Uh, he, he doesn't really treat her with the respect she deserves. The criminal justice system in general, uh, you know, and I, I'm sure you yourself know, isn't always kind uh, to women attorneys. And so she has a lot of obstacles in her path, uh, including some crooked FBI agents uh, and she has to overcome, overcome their tricks. There are so many questions I want to follow up with, but I want to go on the ones that we discussed. Um, for example, I want to ask uh, the book that was inspired by one of your cases and tell yes. us about what case was that? Well, uh, in, in 1965, there was a, a, a gangster was killed in Boston and it was three years before anybody was prosecuted for his murder. Uh, the prosecution was run by a couple of FBI agents who were in charge of the organized crime squad in Boston for the FBI. And what they did was uh, they ended up framing four innocent men for this murder. And uh, the reason they were framing four innocent men was because one of the real killers was actually an FBI informant. So they were protecting their own informant and they were uh, accusing men who actually had nothing to do with the murder. Those four men were convicted. Three of them were sentenced to death. Uh, they would have been put to death 
except for the fact that the death penalty was declared in, the, in that form it was in, was declared unconstitutional by the United States Supreme Court. So their sentences were changed to life without parole. And one of these men was a man named Peter Lamoni, who, who became my client. Uh, years later, uh, Peter Lamoni spent 33 years in prison. He went to prison mm -hmm. when he was 33 years old. He got out when he was 66. Uh, and the reason he got out uh, was because uh, uh, a guy named Stephen Fleming, who was actually the partner of Whitey Bulger, mm -hmm. uh, pretty famous name in Boston criminal history. Stephen Fleming was being prosecuted and, and his defense was that he shouldn't be convicted of crimes because the FBI told him he could commit crimes. It was actually his younger brother, Jimmy, who had killed this guy back in 1965. And this all ended up coming out in federal court in a, a case in front of Judge Mark Wolf, who wrote a lengthy opinion. And then Janet Reno, who was the assistant attorney general, or was the attorney general, rather at the time when uh, uh, Bill Clinton was uh, president, she appointed a task force to investigate whether FBI agents had committed any crimes. And that task force furnished some documents to Mr. Lamoni's then attorneys, and eventually the case against him was dropped. Uh, and then those lawyers came to me and said, would I help them bring a, a lawsuit against the United States government for his wrongful imprisonment for 33 years? Mm -hmm. That sounds a fascinating story. Um, if we have time, Professor Avery, would you read a little bit about your book to us? You mean from the book? Yes, from your book. Okay, well, yes, if we have time at the end, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, but we, you know, we brought this lawsuit against the FBI on behalf of Mr. Lamoni and the other men, and we ended up winning the case. And uh, the, the judge ended up awarding the four families who were involved a total of $102 million in damages. It was the largest judgment ever against the FBI in a, in a civil case. So that kind of gave me the idea of, you know, FBI agents who might frame innocent people for murder. And that became kind of the inspiration for cooperating witness. Um, Professor, you are famous for um, being, specializing in police misconduct cases. And this is why I believe they approach you. Um, how, why did you pick uh, that area of the law to specialize? When I was a, a young lawyer uh, back in the 70s, uh, I've been a lawyer now for 52 years, <laughs> which is, uh, kind of surprises me. But uh, back in the 70s, I was a young lawyer in New Haven, Connecticut. And uh, the local police were engaged in a lot of practices that, that weren't right. And my partner and I thought, maybe if we just filed a, a, an action for damages, a civil rights suit for damages, every time we heard about something that wasn't correct, maybe we could help uh, deter police misconduct. And so we started filing cases. We, we filed dozens of cases uh, back in New Haven in those days. And uh, then when I moved to Boston, I, I just kept doing it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, another lawyer in Philadelphia and I wrote a, a book about police misconduct, a, a treatise for lawyers who do this kind of work. And uh, it kind of became in many ways my, my life's work. So when Lamoni's lawyers were looking for somebody, they, they did call me because they had heard about me. And uh, that really became the, the biggest case of my career. Congratulations, Professor. Um, does that have anything to do, you wanted me to talk to you about the National Police um, Accountability Project. Is that based on your experience in the police misconduct? Can you tell us yes. about it? Uh, about, uh, about 21 years ago, some other lawyers from the National Lawyers Guild and I started the National Police Accountability Project. And it was uh, something that we set up to help lawyers who were doing police cases across the country. And when we got started uh, 20 some years ago, I, I think we had about 40 lawyers in the group and uh, I knew all of them personally. 
Now we have 600 lawyers in the group mm -hmm. and uh, the group's budget has grown enormously. Uh, most of the time we were in business, we had just one employee. Uh, but after George Floyd was murdered by the police in Minneapolis, we got a lot of new donations. And now we have five staff people uh, and we're very active, not just in uh, in running a listserv and providing educational materials to lawyers, but in working on legislation across the country, particularly at the state level, uh, to try to get various, well, police reform measures enacted. So the, the National Police yeah. Accountability Project is, uh, you know, originally it was kind of a little baby of mine, <laughs> mine and others. And, uh, and now it's, I think, a major force uh, for police reform in this country. I'm, I'm very proud of the work that my friends and I did in that regard. That seems, that is a fascinating project and a very important contribution to the legal field, Professor Avery. Um, today, we are talking to Michael Avery, former professor, law school professor, and as you have heard, he has been an amazing figure in the legal community. Um, professor Avery, where can we find your book? Well, you can find it on Amazon, <laughs> uh, yeah. also at Barnes and Noble. Uh, uh, there are several places you can buy it, but those are probably uh, two, two of the easiest ones. Um, and, uh, you know, you can either get it in a Kindle format uh, and just download it to your device, or you, you can buy it in, you know, in the paperback like this, and then, uh, then you'll have it. Um, professor, uh, you, have you retired from your tenure at Suffolk Law School? I did. I, I, re I retired in 2014. And uh, interestingly enough, as soon as I retired as a tenured professor, I went back to school as a student. I, I enrolled in a, in a um, program at Bennington College, a Master of Fine Arts program uh, that was um, a, a limited residency program. We, we went uh, for a week in January and a week in June and then uh, sent materials back and forth to our uh, teachers and got comments on our work. And uh, at the end of it, I, I got a master's in fine arts. And uh, I have to say, I, I, I learned a lot about writing that I hadn't known before. It was a real eye-opening experience and, and a terrific experience. Well, tell us about it. Why don't you describe a little bit more of it? What is it like after being a professor and teaching to being taught Tell us that, it's interesting. Well, you know, it was very challenging because uh, as an undergraduate, uh, I had majored in political science and economics, and then I'd gone to law school and I'd written uh, a number of books, uh, nonfiction books, but uh, I'd never really studied uh, English literature. I mean, I read a lot, but I, I didn't have any formal undergraduate training. And now I found myself in a graduate seminar and whoops, I forgot to take the undergraduate courses. So uh, it was uh, very, very challenging for me, but I was in with a wonderful group of people. I, I was the oldest person in the class. I was paying for it with my social security checks. And the youngest person was a, a guy about 25 who uh, was from New Orleans. I was living in New Orleans at the time. And, he and I became very good friends and I became very good friends with the other people in the class. And it was just a, it was a very uh, remarkable group of people, very uh, supportive of each other, no jealousy, no competitiveness, just, uh, uh, you know, mutual respect and affection. Um, it, was, it was a wonderful experience for me. Professor, I want to ask you what else you have written, but before that, I would like to ask you, how do you find the difference between what you wrote as a lawyer and the way lawyers write from writing a book that is based on one of your cases, but it's more like a novel, it's a story and could be fiction? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
you know, lawyers write, uh, when a lawyer writes, the, the writer is some distance from the page. Everything is objective, uh, it's logical, uh, it, you're usually engaged in persuasive writing, so you're making a, an argument. But when, uh, when you're writing popular nonfiction or when you're writing fiction, uh, I think you, you feel the author more on the page and, and you're involved in, a, in an emotional way, in a, in a subjective way with what you're writing. Uh, you know, if you're writing fiction, your imagination is what uh, decides what goes on the page and, and your imagination is influenced a great deal by who you are, what kind of things you think about. And uh, so it's a more, it's much more personal. The kind of, the kind of writing that the cooperating witness is, is a much more personal than the kind of writing you do as a, as a lawyer. And uh, in some ways it's a lot more fun. Sounds very interesting because it sounds like we will learn a lot about you from your writing this book, Fiction. Um, so what else have you written? You mentioned treatises. Why don't you tell us everything you've written? Well, well if you I want to know everything, of, well, tell us what else. <laughs> I happening? wrote a treatise about police misconduct litigation, which is published by uh, West, my co-authors and I. And then uh, Professor Broden from Boston College Law School and I uh, took over uh, former Chief Justice Liakos's Handbook of Massachusetts Evidence. Yeah. So both of those books are updated every year. So it's kind of a constant, uh, I'm constantly working on those books. Uh, but, but then I have a couple of other books. I, I wrote a book called, or I edited a book actually called We Dissent, which was ah. a series of uh, essays mm -hmm. by civil rights lawyers uh, quarreling with decisions of the Rehnquist court uh, that were too conservative uh, mm -hmm. for, for our taste. Mm -hmm. And then the most recent book I wrote with a former student from Suffolk, a oh. woman named Danielle McLaughlin. She had been my research assistant. She was helping mm -hmm. me with the book and she was doing such great work. I said to her, why don't we, why don't we co-author this book? And she became my co-author. That book was the Federalist Society, how conservatives oh. took the law back from liberals. And uh, that, that book came out in 2013. And it's still a very important resource for people who wanna learn about the Federalist Society. You know, six members of the United States Supreme Court are members of the Federalist Society. So the Federalist Society mm. has extraordinary influence over how the law is being developed in the United States right now. So uh, I was happy to, to write a book which gave people some background on that group and, and their ideas and how they've gotten to be so powerful. This is just an amazing interview because of the contributions that you have made to, to the legal field where your treatises and the books that you have mentioned, not to mention this last book, a cooperating witness. Um, however, I see that your main character is a woman and you are a man. So that's another extremely interesting aspect of this book that you seem to understand women and depict them in such a way that it seems like a woman wrote it. Oh, well, that's very kind of you to say. <laughs> uh, you know, that was one of the most difficult things about the book. Uh, Fortunately, I have two daughters, uh, mm -hmm. both of whom are very strong feminists and uh, independent women. Uh, and then uh, my wife, uh, Jill Como, uh, read, the, read the chapters as I was writing them. So, so I got a lot of advice from my daughters and, and from Jill about, uh, about things. And maybe I'd write a chapter and I'd give it to them and they'd say, you know, that's not really what a, what a woman would do. We do. <laughs> and so I tried to, to learn as much as I could as I went along, but, but that, was, that was definitely a challenge, uh, but it was, it was also interesting. And, and uh, you know, now I'm, I'm working on a sequel. Oh. Susan Sorella is going to come back uh, in the cooperating witness. She's a law student, but 
In the meantime, she's graduated from law school. She started practicing law in Boston and, uh, and in the sequel, she has a, a new case that, uh, that she's working on. So hopefully, I, I hope to finish that by the end of the year. When did your book, The Cooperating Witness, come out? Came out in July 2020. Ah, wonderful. And when do you expect the sequel to come out? Well, hopefully, if I finish it by the end of this year, hopefully in 2023. Okay, so we do have 10 minutes left, but oh. why don't you tell us a little bit as to what do you like about writing? And then would you mind reading a little bit from your new book? Okay. Um, well, what I like about writing is mm -hmm. uh, communicating with people who are not in my presence. Uh, you know, Stephen King says that uh, mm -hmm. a writer is engaged in a kind of mental telepathy in that you, you send thoughts out into the world. And uh, mm -hmm. when I'm writing uh, my treatises, uh, you know, I've spent much of my life as a teacher and I think a writer is a, is a kind of teacher. When I'm writing my treatises, I, I'm trying to imagine what kind of problems the lawyers who are doing these cases have and how I can help them uh, with the writing I'm doing. Uh, when I'm writing fiction, uh, I'm telling a story and uh, I'm trying to make it as interesting as I can for somebody who's, you know, I can't see their facial expression when they're reading it, <laughs> uh, but it, it's a kind of communication. It's, a, it's a, almost a surreal kind of communication. And then I guess the other thing I like about it is uh, if you write something, it's there. And long after I'm gone, uh, some of my words will still be there. Uh, hopefully every now and then somebody might take a peek at them. I hope so. Uh, well, so. well I, I, I can, I can. You can, you, you can little, oh, if you would read a little bit about uh, one of the pieces of legacies that you're leaving in the legal profession out of your many legacies, um, the most impressive that I am, uh, the one that I think is amazing is your evidence book. That is, oh. we use that just every day, <laughs> us lawyers. Well, I'll, um, I'll read a little bit of the chapter in which the reader meets Susan Sorella. Wonderful, thank you. On Thursday night, near the end of her shift, Susan Sorella perched on a stool at a counter in the kitchen at Gabriella's filling salt shakers. She was wearing blue jeans and a white blouse, all the uniform the restaurant required. Her father, Lorenzo, emerged from the walk-in refrigerator with a towel in his hand. Can we talk about next week's menu, he asked. Mike, one of the waiters, burst through the door from the dining room with a frown on his face and grabbed Susan's father by the arm. Enzo, there's somebody here to see you, he said. Who is it, her father said. You better go see, Mike said. Mm -hmm. Her dad put down the towel and entered the dining room, leaving the kitchen door ajar. Susan peered through the opening. Jesus Christ, 20 feet away, alone at a table with his back to the wall, sat Frank Romano, the head of the mob in Boston. He looked exactly like the picture the Boston Herald always <laughs> ran of him when they did a story about organized crime. Tall and grim. Huh? We have one minute left. Oh, okay. Well, book. there you go. The audience is going to be extremely piqued by what you just read. <laughs> I think that this is amazing. Uh, have you thought about making it a movie in one minute? <laughs> if I had the power to make it a movie, I, I'd be glad to do so. I, 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 I think it would be great on the, on the big screen. I think it would be great on the big screen. And for our audience, uh, just letting you know that this is an episode of Discovering the Law. This particular episode will be posted at www.discoveringthelaw.com. And it will also be at the Vimeo page with the Studio Boston Neighborhood Network. Uh, today, we are talking and learning from Professor Michael Avery, superstar, former civil rights lawyer. Thank you for watching. Thank you for inviting me, Lucy.